Good morning, guys. Thank you for being with us at Center Grove through our live stream. Most of you guys are uh, watching this through Facebook, and we're grateful that you're here, that you watch on Facebook. Um, there are a few people that watch on YouTube, and so um, this morning I wanted to encourage you to um, go over to YouTube if you have not already, and um, some subscribe to our Center Grove um, page. The more subscribers we have, the better that is for us. Uh, when it comes to being able to get the message out to more people and in a more convenient way. So um, if you're usually a Facebook watcher, go over to YouTube and subscribe to our YouTube channel there. I also wanted to mention before we get started that um, some of you may have already downloaded the Generosity app, but there is a new way to give to Center Grove, and that's really important since we're not together um, in, for services um, at this time. And so um, go to your app store, download Generosity by Lifeway, and that's a convenient way for you to do mobile giving through your phone. And um, hope that some of you will take advantage of it during our time away. Um, I also wanted to let you know that um, when we started our live stream, we um, first said that we would do that for two weeks. And um, we've decided that we're going to continue to meet like this until we feel like it's safe for us all to come together again and, and worship and so um, try to get it, keep that regular habit of, of worship um, within your home to, for us all to be together as a community at 11 o'clock for worship as we stream that through um, live streaming. And then um, also, you know, make that special. Um, have your Bible in hand. Have, if you are uh, generally a note taker, kind of run through your regular routine. And I think it will help us maintain a sense of community and an attitude of worship. Um, Cody's video on Facebook was great the other day to um, give that little reminder to us. And so keep that in mind as, as you meet, and we'll let you know as we kind of develop and as our schedule changes. Let's say a word of prayer, and then we'll get started with today's message. Lord, we are grateful for how you love us and for how you provide for us. And Lord, we're grateful for what you have done for us. In your son's death on the cross, his glorious resurrection, and Lord, we thank you for the promised gift of the Holy Spirit, that, that spirit which binds us together today, that spirit which will convict hearts and lives, that will take your word and transform it in our hearing. And Lord, we are grateful for what you do for us. So help us today as we listen to your word, that we would focus on you and nothing else, uh, despite any distractions. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you've got your Bibles and you want to turn with me to on the book of Matthew, chapter 19, we looked at the first half of that chapter last week, and this week we're going to look at the last half together. And um, in Matthew 19, we're going to talk about this idea, how good people are saved. If I were to ask people in general that question, if, if, if we assume that people believe in heaven, that there is something after this life... And then we were to ask that, that, that person the question, how does a person go to heaven? How, how's a person saved? Or how's a person attain salvation in order to be right with God and, and go to heaven? The, the answers to that would be, there would be numerous answers to that. People would tell us all sorts of things. They would relate it or attribute it to um, adhering to the tenets of a certain faith. They might um, say that it was about being a part of a certain group or denomination or something like that. They might say that it had to do with something that you do. Like, you know, they, if you read your Bible or if you pray or if you go to church. If, if we were to ask the question, how, do, how is a person saved? How does a person get into heaven? There would be a ton of theories. And, and the problem with all of those theories is that um, uh, nobody would know unless they died first right? How a person would go to heaven. Unless we put our faith and trust in what scripture says. Because scripture gives us some very definite ways that we could go to heaven. But apart from that, people are left to all kinds of theories about, um, that, are in, that they hold in order to give them assurance that they will be in heaven one day. And probably the greatest theory that people hold, probably the one that is the most prevalent is the good person theory, the good people theory. That if they were standing before God and God were to say to them, why should I let you into heaven? The answer would be, well, God, I'm a good person. God, I, I, you know, I'm not perfect, but, but definitely my good outweighs my bad. And I've, I've tried my best to be a good person. 
And that would probably be the most popular theory that people would say as to how people go to heaven. But that's not what the Bible says about how a person goes to heaven, about how good people are saved. In fact, I've titled the message that today because we're going to look at a passage in which Jesus encounters a man who is a good person. By everything that we know about him, he is a good person. He's a morally good person. He's an upstanding person in his community. Everything about him is a good person. But when he leaves Jesus, he leaves unsatisfied. He does not have the assurance that he thought he would get that he would be in heaven one day. Let's read this passage. There's a little section before that encounter and a little section after that encounter, but both of them, I believe, relate to the conversation that this man has with Jesus. So let's read, starting in Matthew 19 and verse 13. Then children were brought to Jesus, that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and he went away. Before we keep reading, note that here Jesus says that uh, the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. It's not children per se. It's those who come as children. We've looked at this in previous passages, this um, humility, this um, desperation and helplessness. That's the kind of person that, that comes to Jesus with that desperation and that helplessness, that, that's the kind of person who sees the kingdom of heaven. Notice, too, as we begin in verse 16, that that is not how this man approaches Jesus. And behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good If you would enter life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said, all these I've kept. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go. Sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished. Notice in this passage and, I mean, in this encounter after the man leaves and with the children, the disciples seem to be on the outside. They're confused about the whole situation. And um, in this passage in verse 25, it says they were greatly astonished. And they said, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, see, We have left everything and we followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sister or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. This interaction with this young man that we find in this passage, he's a good man who has a desire to have eternal life and be saved. And yet when he leaves Jesus, he's disappointed. He does not have that assurance of eternal life. Let's work through this passage and understand that what we find presented in this passage is that salvation is a free gift. Uh, not It's devoid of human merit. It's not something that we have done that brings about our salvation. It's in coming as little children, coming in humility, in helplessness, in desperation to him that a person is saved. That's how all people are saved, including those who 
um, we would say are good people. Let's look at this guy and let's see if what he goes through, his discussion with Jesus can be instructive for us. The first thing I want you to notice about this guy is I want you to notice his desire. When he comes to Jesus in verses 16 and 17, his desire is to have the assurance that he has eternal life. That's what he's looking for. He's looking for a peace and he wants to have that checked off. I've done all I can do to have eternal life, that I can be assured that when I die, I'll go to heaven, I'll be right with God. What can I do to have that assurance? And I'll be honest with you, there's people everywhere that are kind of looking for that assurance. There's people all over that would love to have that assurance that they're right with God, that the way that they live uh, will, will bring them to him when they die. And they're looking for that assurance. But note how this guy goes about it and how that desire is expressed. This guy, first of all, has it all together. We need to note about this guy. When he shows up to Jesus and asks this question, he, this is a guy who by every, everyone's estimation would have had it all together. In fact, we call him, the way that my Bible has this labeled is, he is a rich, young ruler. Um, and, and each one of those descriptors tell us a little bit about how this guy had it all together. He was rich. He didn't want for anything. He had all that he needed. He didn't worry about where his next meal was coming from or how he was going to pay the bills next month. He had plenty. He was successful, obviously, right? And so people looked at that material wealth and they said, ah, he's a success. He's got it all together financially. This guy was young. He had done that early in life. He was considered a success early in life. He, he was probably a person that people would describe as ambitious or driven. He was a guy that, that seemed to have it all together where people much older than him had not figured it out yet. This guy had. He had it all together. And then Luke's gospel is the only gospel that calls him a ruler but because Luke does that, it kind of gives this idea that, that there's authority. He, he carried some, his word or his uh, language, his opinion carried some kind of weight either in the religious community or the civil community. This guy, by everyone's estimation, had it all together. And yet even this guy who's got it all together has a desire to be right with God and be assured. He's looking for that peace and satisfaction and calm that would come in knowing that he's right with God. Notice the encounter in verse 16. Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? He's looking for a thing that he can do to check this off his list. And if you'll notice, Jesus doesn't immediately answer his question why do you ask me, Jesus says, about what is good? There is only one who is good. Before Jesus ever gets to the heart of his question, before Jesus works through this process with this young man, the first step in the process is to get this guy's focus off of his own goodness because this guy comes seemingly, uh, he, it's implied that he believes he can do something good enough to merit his salvation. And so Jesus wants to stop him in his tracks, get him thinking not about his own goodness, but thinking about his apparent goodness in light of God's ultimate goodness. That's why Jesus says there is only one who is good. You're looking to do good things and be good, and, but there's only one who is ultimately, absolutely good. Get your eyes off who you think you are and turn them to him and you'll see yourself in a different light. I do believe that this guy, when he comes to Jesus and he asks that question, what good deed must I do? I believe that this guy thought that he was going to come to Jesus and Jesus was going to say, well, I mean, dude, you've already done it. I mean, look at you. Look at your life. Look how good it is. Look at how godly your life is. I really think this guy came looking for Jesus not to tell him something to do, but to reassure him that he was already there and that he, that he had nothing to worry about, that he was certainly a part of the kingdom, that he certainly had done something to merit eternal life. His desire was not the eternal life as much as it was the assurance that would come with knowing that he was right with God. 
He wanted to check it off his list, and this is his ultimate desire. All of us, to some degree, have that desire where we long to know that we're right with God, where we would long to know that, that, that we will have an, have an assurance of heaven when we die. And, and this guy, that was his desire when he came to Jesus. I want you to look secondly, though, at a second part to this um, passage, and let's think about his deception. This guy not only had a desire, but he had deceived himself. He had deceived himself into thinking that, first of all, he was a good person. You see, the problem with the message title is this. How are good people saved? Probably a better question is, who are good people? Because this guy had an assumption that he was a good person who could do something. He was deceived about his own goodness. And the truth is, is that the Bible teaches us that, that in truth, we are not good. There is nothing in us that merits enough goodness. There is nothing that we could ever do that would, that would be good enough in order to erase the debt of sin. This man doesn't come to Jesus humbly. He comes to Jesus deceived into thinking that his own goodness would save him. This is his attitude in asking the question in verse 16 is much different than, say, like the Philippian jailer. It's similar. Remember, the Philippian jailer said, um, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He was putting himself out there as like, what's required of me? What, I'm desperate to do anything in order to be saved. This guy was putting some parameters on it for Jesus. What good deed must I do? What thing do I need to accomplish? He's, he's assuming that salvation is based on works and that salvation is something that he can obtain for himself. And so Jesus wants to take him down a road to make him understand that every person is in need of God's grace. In verse 17, when Jesus gets done um, telling him to not focus on his own goodness, but to think about God's absolute goodness, Jesus asks, or, or says this statement to him, if you would enter life, keep the commandments. That, that statement that Jesus makes He's trying to get this man to understand that it's only by the grace of God that a person can be saved. None of us are good enough. I want you to understand that Jesus was not suggesting that this man was able to keep the law, and if he was able to keep all the law of God, then he would be fine. He would be all right if he was able to keep the law of God because it's impossible as we'll see in a minute. And, and really this statement that Jesus makes, the way that Jesus goes about this, part of the reason the, the disciples were astonished in the end is because these Jews had been told their whole life that if you follow the commandments of God, if you obey the law of God, if, the, the more that you keep the law, the closer you are to God. And so when Jesus asked the question, when he says to him, if you would enter eternal life, just keep the commandments. And here's where the man's self-deception really becomes apparent. Well, which ones? Jesus begins to name some off that would be familiar to you. Many of them are, uh, the, the ones that he lists here are part of the Ten Commandments, the, the representation of all of God's law. And he begins to list things off. And oh, the young man says in verse 20, I have kept all of these. He was deceived about himself. He was unwilling to admit that he had messed up. Even if you look at the short list that Jesus gave, which one of us has not done the things that are on that list? Have we all been obedient to our parents all the time? Is there any of us that hasn't told a lie? What about stealing? I, I remember the first thing I stole, it was a bean from the Ace Hardware store in Cedartown, Georgia. And I felt awful about stealing one beam from the Ace Hardware. But we've all done those sort of things. We've, and because we've all done them, this guy here, he's self-deceived. Oh, I haven't done anything. I've, I've, I've kept all of those from my youth, uh, one translation says. The Liberty Commentary says, His self-centered wealth and luxurious self-righteousness had blinded him to his real weakness. 
You see, I believe that Jesus, asking about those commandments, Jesus wasn't asking about those things, implying that if you kept all those, then you would be right with God. I think what Jesus was doing is Jesus was trying to show him by naming those particular commandments that that he had not done those things. This man was just unwilling to admit it. In fact, Galatians 3 in verse 24 says that the law of God, the Ten Commandments, what's represented there, and then then the law of God is our schoolmaster. It was our schoolmaster teaching us that we had a need for Christ, showing us our need for Christ to come. This idea that, that, that none of us are able to keep the law of God, and, and the law teaches us that. When we look at just the Ten Commandments, say, there's not a one of us that hasn't broken those Ten Commandments. Therefore, all of us are sinners and are in need of God's grace. It, it, this guy wants it to be about his works. He's kind of setting it up to say, oh, I've done all of these. I've kept all the law. And the problem with that kind of mindset is, is if you want your salvation to be about works, if you want your salvation to be about keeping all the rules that God gives us, the problem with that is you, you can't do it, right? You can't come to church enough. You can't give enough money. You can't keep all of those commandments. And if you're going to choose to have a salvation that's based on works, it's got to be all or nothing, right? See, a person who wants their, their salvation to be based on works wants to bring up all of the good things that they do and forget about the things that they do that's not so good. And it can't be that way. It has to be all or nothing. In fact, the the Bible tells us that if we have broken God's law in one area, in just one spot, then we've broken all of it. Probably another good illustration of that is from the pulpit commentary, which says, one disease is enough to kill a man. His brain may be sound, his lungs untouched, all of his organs, but one may be healthy. But if one vital organ is attacked, all the other healthy organs will not save him. And so it is with character. One vice destroys the whole. I brought with me up here another way to illustrate that. I have some water. You can't feel it, but this jug is very cold. There's sweat on the outside where um, that water is clean and clear and cool. I don't know if you can hear that, but man, that sounds good. It's good. And if I were to take a drink of that, like it looks good in that clear glass. And to be honest, right now I'm kind of thirsty and it looks good. So I'm going to take a sip of it. But if I were to say to you, would you like a sip of that water? Oh, and it looks good. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you, you'd have the same desire that I would have for that for that cup of water. But what if I were to change things? What if I were to say, mm. and I were to say, how about now? Would you have a sip of water now? It, yeah, is that me, Corona? Is that, <laughs> is that, how about now? Would you take a sip now? No, David, you spit, well, it's just a little spit. I mean, it was just a little bit of spit. I mean, the, most of that's water. It, it's good. It, it's cold and it's clear and it's clean. It, it's just like it was before, except for that little bit of spit on the top. But if we've broken God's law in one place, it's polluted all of us. We are a sinner. All of us are polluted thoroughly. Because now those germs are all the way through this water and you certainly wouldn't want to take a sip. This man was deceived into believing that he was fine, that that his good outweighed his bad, and he was okay. He was right with God. This man's later actions would show us that the truth is he hadn't kept all of the commandments, right? I mean, the truth is is that later on Jesus will say, sell all that you have and give it to the poor and and follow me. And what does the man say? No, I can't do that. So in truth, he did not love God with all of his heart. He he didn't have God as first in his life. He didn't honor the Lord. and He had an idol. His possessions were his idol. He had set those things above God. And so he had certainly broken those commandments. Although it was unbeknownst to him, he couldn't see those things. He couldn't see those places in his life where he had broken God's law. He couldn't see himself as a sinner. I love this. This is long, and the, the language is, is 
dated. But I want you to listen to this. This is great. This is from the pulpit commentary talking about this man and how he came to Jesus. He came to Jesus not to be taught the rudiments, but to receive the finishing touches of a religious character. And he's told that he is wrong to the foundation. He is in the position of a person who goes to his medical advisor complaining of a slight uneasiness, which he supposes a tonic will remove, and is told that he has heart disease or cancer. Or he's in the position of a sanguine inventor who has spent several years on the elaboration of a machine and at last puts it into the hands of the practical man merely to get steam applied and the fittings adjusted and is told by the practical man that the whole thing is wrong in conception and can by no possibility ever be made to work. He sees himself as he never saw himself before. He never knew how much he loved his money till he found that he would risk his soul rather than part with his money. He never knew how little he cared for the poor till he found he was not prepared to help them by becoming one of them. He never dreamt he was ungodly till he found he preferred his few acres of land to that person whom he had confessed to be incarnate goodness. You see, the problem with the question, how are good people saved? is that none of us are good people. No matter what we think about ourselves, no matter how many good things that we do, or no matter even how, uh, how great the percentage is of the commandments that we keep, the truth is there's always a percent that we have fallen down on. And because of that one percent, because of that one drop of spit in the cup, we are thoroughly contaminated. And we are apart from doing anything that would merit our own salvation. You see this man and his desire. You see his deception. But I want you to look lastly at his decision. Starting in verse 21, when this guy answers, oh, I've kept all those, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him in verse 21, if you would be perfect, before we read any more in the verse, this doesn't mean without error. The idea of perfect here is the idea of, of completeness. In other words, this guy comes with a desire to be able to check this off on his list. He wants an assurance of rightness with God. He wants an assurance of a home in heaven. And Jesus says to him, if you would be perfect, if you want to check this off your list, here's what you do. Sell what you possess and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Jesus was not suggesting that a person is saved by selling the things that they have and giving it to the poor. That's not what brings about eternal life. In fact, Jesus never commanded another person in the Gospels to do this. What Jesus is doing is Jesus is putting his finger on something that the man was unwilling to do because Jesus was wanting this young man to recognize and understand his wealth, his possessions were the thing that were the hindrance to him coming to God. I love what Robert Gundry says about this, that Jesus did not command all his followers to sell all their possessions gives comfort only to the kind of people to whom he would issue that command. And so if we, if we think about this in terms of, oh, well, a person's not saved um, by selling their possessions and by doing that, I'm good, I can keep my possessions. Uh, maybe if those possessions are in a place that's of higher priority to you than God, maybe this is the kind of request that Jesus would ask of you. Maybe it's putting a finger on the idols in your life. I don't know about you, but when I have read through Scripture and been convicted by it, or when I have been denied something and gotten angry about it, Every one of those times, God is putting his finger on something that is an idol in my life, something that I'm giving precedence to more than him. And here, Jesus says, for this young man, riches were the problem for him. It was a barrier to him. In fact, Jesus would say later on down in the passage, he would say to them that it's uh, verse 23, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. And and then he says in verse 24, it's it's not just a difficulty, it's an impossibility. For it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. This was astonishing to the disciples. That's why they asked, well, then the, the next verse is, they were astonished and they said, who then can be saved? 
See, there was this idea which uh, was a, a wrong idea that the Jews held, which is frankly a wrong idea that many people still hold today, that material wealth is equal to God's favor. That if you have material wealth, then you are in God's favor and, and everything must be right between you and God. In their minds, material wealth was a blessing from God. If you had been ultimately blessed, then God was certainly on your side. You certainly had favor with him. Now, we know this is not true, right? That would mean that every person who was poor was wrong, uh, that every person who was poor was outside of God's will. This would mean that any person who suffered was outside of God's will, and that's just not true. Good people aren't always rich. But in their minds, it was a picture of, of, of rightness with God if you had a lot of wealth. That's why they ask, then who can be saved? Because in their minds, if, if this guy can't be saved, if this guy's not right with God, if, if this good guy who's a rich, young ruler, if he can't, is not right with God, then who can be? Who can be saved? They uh, believed that this physical wealth represented righteousness before God. And, and even though they held that view, the Bible even kind of goes against that. In fact, the Bible even says in some places that wealth is a barrier to, to, to coming to God. It certainly was for this man, and that's what Jesus says here. But Paul says that to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Paul writes to Timothy and says, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. You see, Jesus' discussion is not that rich people can't be saved. That's not the idea. But that it's a very difficult thing for us to take our successes and set them aside and come to him in desperation. D.A. Carson says, Material blessing drives people to the self-assurance and self-confidence that refuses to acknowledge the need for grace. In this guy's case, there was a wealth there that caused that to be true. But now let's, let's be frank. There are lots of things that could drive people to have a self-assurance and a self-confidence that would cause them to lack a, an acknowledgement of their need of grace. For instance, a person could be successful and they could be popular and because they're well-liked and because everyone tells them that they're, that they're the best, then they have this assurance that surely I'm right with God. You could have a person who is morally good, who does moral good things, helps people out, does all that, and they rely on that goodness rather than on the grace of God. That goodness becomes a barrier to them coming to God because they don't recognize that they have failed along the way, that there is sin in their life, and that sin makes them thoroughly a sinner, thoroughly corrupt, and in need of God's grace. And so for this man, it was riches, but really it could have been anything, right? Could have been anything. This passage is an interesting passage because Jesus is telling us here, that we must come to him, if this guy teaches us anything, it's that it's we must come broken, empty-handed, realizing there is nothing good in us that is able to obtain salvation. In fact, the Bible says that none are righteous, not even one of us, that we don't seek after God. It's only because God reaches out to us, it's only because God convicts us with his Holy Spirit that we are drawn to him, that we come to him. Today, he may be doing that. Today, you may be listening to this message, and when we started this message, you said to yourself, I'm a good person. I'm assured of a, a home in heaven. I know I am because I'm a good person. And that would have been your attitude. That would have been your thought. If you would have been standing before God prior to this message, and God would have asked you, why should I let you into heaven? Your answer may have been to him, I'm a good person. But this guy teaches us that there are no good people. The only answer to that question, the only answer to that question, why should I let you into my heaven? I am saved, I am redeemed, 
by the precious blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for me. It's how good people are saved. It's how rich people are saved. It's how bad people are saved. It's how children are saved, and it's how murderers are saved, and it's how all of those who seem to be so despicable that they could never do anything to merit God's grace, that's how they're saved, is through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. By repenting of our sin, coming to him in faith, and fully relying on his grace. There's one thing that I want to throw in before I end the message. It's probably the thing that has stood out to me more than any other thing that's in this passage. And frankly, it's something that I have never seen as I have studied this passage. It's found in verse 21. When Jesus asked the man to give up his possessions, sell everything he has and give it to the poor. And that's what we focus on. But if you read that verse and you really pay attention to it, Jesus is not telling the man what he has to give up. The, Jesus is telling the man what he's going to gain. When we think about the rich young ruler, we often think about that Jesus asked him to give up his possessions. And that's true, he did. But think about what he was asked to give up in light of what it was said he would gain. Verse 21 in its entirety reads, If you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess, and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. Get rid of those things that are temporary. Get rid of those things that keep you from coming to me. Come, follow me, and, and you'll gain the kingdom of heaven. Enter the kingdom of heaven. You'll have treasure in heaven, the passage said. Jesus was asking to him to give up a paltry little pile for infinite wealth. I'm not talking about physical wealth. I'm not talking about material success. This man wanted the assurance of eternal life. And the passage says that he left sorrowful. He left grieved. He did not have that assurance because he was unwilling to give up something small and temporary for something unfathomable and eternal. Today, I don't know what it is that would keep you from coming to Jesus, but would you forsake all else for him? Good people are saved through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And today, as we... As I pray and close this message out, I would invite you that if he's shown you your need for him, to pray a prayer of repentance to him, to ask him to forgive you, repent of your sin, and cling to nothing else but Jesus crucified and resurrected. Know that Jesus is the only way that you have hope of a home in heaven. Jesus said so himself when Jesus said in John 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Lord, we're grateful that you've made us that promise. Lord, we're grateful that while there are many theories about how a person could obtain eternal life, Lord, we're grateful that you have given us a very clear, definite statement that no one comes to the Father except through you. And so, Lord, I pray that today as we um, experience the, this message through the technology available to us, Lord, if there's one listening today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, Lord, I pray that already they are praying a prayer of repentance and that would bring you to them, that would bring salvation to their heart, where they would have treasure in heaven. Lord, forsaking all else and clinging to you, uh, the treasure in the field. Lord, we love you so much. Lord, I pray that, you would, um, that we would see your multiplied blessings in our life that we would see life and vitality, and that we would not be sorrowful as we walk um, this earth, but, Lord, that we would be joyful and happy, assured that with our faith in you, we have a home in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.